So our main talk today is going to be, uh, it's not easy being green uh, by Alexis Potterman. Uh, you may have heard that we had a talk about Charlie Ebdo today, which is a lot different than algae. Um, so our, our speaker had to reschedule because of some, uh, a car, I think a car accident. He's okay, um, but he had to reschedule. So Alexis jumped in at the last minute to get this scheduled for us. So th thank you so much for that. Um. And I'm wearing green. That was. That, no, that was. All right, I'll try to stay close to the mic. I usually like to move around when I talk, but um, like you said, this was kind of a last minute presentation, so I might be relying on my notes a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, so a few years ago, I actually uh, got involved with some algae-based biofuel research. Uh, and even though I didn't stick with it, I still kind of have a, a fondness for it. Um, and it's really pretty fascinating. And so I thought I would, and I had the presentation halfway ready, so <laughs> I figured I would share it with you guys. All right, so there's not actually a set definition of what algae is. Uh, it's a very broad category. It can be single-celled, it can be multi-celled. It's usually uh, eukaryote, like non-bacteria, but then you also can, some definitions do include cyanobacteria in that. Um, it just depends who you're talking to. Uh, it usually gets a bad rap, though. You hear a lot of, uh, about in the summertime, it is what um, is the red algae that causes the dead zone. In this picture, it doesn't really look red. On the computer, it shows up it's pretty red. Um, but it's harmful uh, bacteria that causes the dead zone. It's that brown algae that shows up on the beaches and is stinky and prickly and you don't like it on the beach. But then it's also the green kelp forest, the macroalgae with the you know, sea otters frolicking about, or the single-cell diatoms that look really, really pretty, uh, in my opinion. Um, it can also be single-celled green algae, multicellular cyanobacteria. Uh, and this is what is used to produce biofuel. So why should we care? Um, one of the problems we're having right now is maybe too much production of oil. Why do we need biofuel? Uh, there is a decreasing accessibility of fossil fuels. We have a dependence on foreign oil here in the, United, uh, the US. We kind of have an uncertain longevity. How long is this oil actually going to last? There are environmental concerns of how we're getting the oil. Um, and of course, global increase in consumption and ever increasing carbon dioxide uh, outputs. Mm. So where is this oil? Why are we having trouble accessing it? Well, <clears throat> in 2014, we actually found a couple of large oil fields, and I use that term loosely. Um, the last major onshore oil field, like the biggest one, uh, was actually found in 1948 at 5 million barrels a day. Um, that actually peaked in 2005. So its production is going downhill, and that's after the advent of fracking. So, <laughs> and then in 2014, uh, they actually found the largest oil fill 18 miles off the coast of Scotland. So that's one of the issues is uh, we've kind of found as much oil as we can on land. We're having to go further offshore, and that's where you kind of run into some problems is um, when you start going into the deep sea exploratory drilling. Um, and then in also recent years, we've started fracking. So we've pretty much gone into the ground, fracturing the rock to try to squeeze out as much oil as possible. Um, Despite all this, we still have like a massive dependence on oil. Uh, the US produces about 9 million barrels a day. We consume 19 million barrels a day. So we're importing 10 million barrels from somewhere. Um, globally, we use about 85 million barrels a day. And by 2030, that number is expected to uh, jump up to 104 million barrels a day. So. Oh, I meant to put this one first. That's what I meant to do. Um, so one of the things is with fracking, we have actually seen an increase in domestic production. There's this theory called peak oil that in 1970, we were supposed to peak out at our oil production and then irreversibly decline. That did actually happen. We peaked out at oil production in 1970. That theory didn't account for fracking. It didn't account for uh, increased technology. 
So in the recent years, we've actually seen an increase in U.S. production. Um, that being said, we're still a million barrels a day short, which kind of sounds like a lot, um, but it doesn't really look like that. Um, but we're still short from our peak production, so there's kind of this uncertainty. Are we going to keep producing more? Is it going to run out at some point? Because at some point, oil is a non-renewable resource. It takes a while to produce oil. When is it going to peak out? We're not entirely sure. Um, <laughs> BP like did a study about 10 years ago that the major oil fields, uh, we have about 1.3 trillion barrels left of proven reserves. So we have 1.3 barrels out there in the world. That's about enough for 40 years of uninterrupted service. So by 2030, 2040 at this point, so 30 more years, um, we might start to kind of see some disruptions. Oh, and then uh, apparently by 2040, we might start going down to 15 million barrels a day uh, produced. And if you remember, US consumes 19 million barrels. So <laughs> think about that. <laughs> um, that being said, like with any oil production, there are environmental concerns. So one of the things that we're trying to do, to de like the U.S. in particular is trying to do to decrease dependence on foreign oil, try to increase oil production. You've probably heard about the Keystone Pipeline. You've probably, you've definitely heard about fracking, like I just mentioned it. Um, the Keystone Pipeline, there are already some pipelines in place. So kind of the question is, well, why don't we just go ahead and put this other pipeline in? We can have a direct connection. What's the big deal? It goes through the sand hills which um, I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but there are some serious like endangered species. It's the only area on earth that's known to kind of produce some of these species, produce some of these environmental benefits. Um, so the pipeline would be going right through that. And some people are concerned about that. We're not entirely sure what that would cause, what some of the problems would be. And I'm not, I wanna make it very clear, I'm not saying that there would be problems. I'm just saying that's definitely a concern that's out there. Another concern with the Keystone Pipeline is it's going right over one of the, the uh, deepest saturated parts of the Ogallala Aquifer. And if any of you have grown up in the Midwest at all, um, you've heard about it. It is the biggest aquifer in the United States. It's where everyone in their farms in the Midwest gets their water from. It's where people in West Texas get their water for their cotton. Um, it's where you get your drinking water from. And so the Keystone Pipeline would be going right over that. So we have a potential, if there was some sort of leak, some sort of spill, for it to potentially pollute drinking water, crop water. You can't really drink oil-contaminated water. It's probably not good for you. Uh, um, so that's one of the concerns. That's one of the biggest concerns. So I don't know what I just. Um, so basically, what do we do about this? Um, we can tax gasoline, like try to reduce the demand. We live in Houston, you know it's probably not gonna do a whole lot, you're driving everywhere. Um, we can raise, uh, or we can reduce the speed limits like they tried in 1970s to uh, optimize fuel efficiency. We can keep trying to sequester that carbon dioxide because we're totally on board with that, right? <laughs> um, there's also the option of biofuels. Obviously this talk is about biofuels. Um, so what kind of biofuels are there? Uh, most of you have probably heard about ethanol from corn. Um, that's definitely the biggest one. There's also some other first-generation biofuels from soybean oil, from palm oil, um, uh, sunflower oil. Uh, there's some second generations from jojoba oil and salmon oil. But then algae is considered a third-generation biofuel because it has um, more opportunities other than just producing ethanol. So what is so special about algae? Like what makes algae so special? Uh, it is considered net neutral, like most biofuels. Uh, it's considered net neutral plant, or net neutral, um, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, it is also, what I've got here? Uh, it has very similar characteristics to uh, fossil fuel based oil. So there are very minimal um, upgrades that you would need to do to refineries or to even your car. Uh, it can grow anywhere like you've seen your neighbors pull in their backyard they've got that nice scum layer growing they're just really ahead of their time like, right? like yeah um <laughs> uh it doesn't compete with food sources 
like corn ethanol does. And it outproduces other sources of biofuel. Like, it's crazy how much it outproduces. Um, and then it also can use recycled water. So you can recycle some of the water over, um, unlike a lot of other things that you need clean water to make. So first. Some of my notes are out of the Anyway, so um, how is it net neutral? It does use photosynthesis to produce energy. So it means it needs carbon dioxide, which is great because when we drive our cars, we're producing carbon dioxide. Um, so one of the things that they're thinking of is to do large scale algae based um, farms, you need a lot of carbon dioxide. So one of the things they're looking into is putting it next to manufacturing plants, places that produce high inputs of carbon dioxide directly sequestering that and directing it into the, the algae farms, essentially, uh, to get free carbon dioxide. I think it's pretty cool. Um, additionally, the lipids that are produced um, by the algae end up acting very similar to oil that we see in petrol diesel. So what happens is whenever you crush the, the oil out, um, it acts very similar to diesel, so that you don't have to upgrade a lot of things, and it can be used directly. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, like I said, it outproduces other um, other sources of biofuel by a ton. Um, corn, you get about 172 liters of oil per hectare. Soybeans, around like 446. Um, for small, for low oil yield microalgae, you get 58,700. Uh, and then for a uh, medium oil yield algae, you get 136,900. Like, that's a lot when you're looking at 172 for corn. Uh, and then on top of that, you can grow algae in vertical uh, bioreactors instead of flat space corn. Um, so how does it work? You've got the bioreactors. You can do an open loop or a closed loop. Closed loop, you would have no access to actual direct sunlight. You would simulate everything. Um, you can have open ponds. Um, this one is actually out in West Texas. It's a, um, the Trans-Pecos location. Uh, basically, what you have there is you have rotors to keep um, the water moving so you get as much access to sunlight and um, carbon dioxide and all the wonderful nutrients that you need to grow algae to make it the most optimal. Um, you, the unfortunate side effect there is it's open to the elements. So gunk gets in, algae take it, evaporation. So one of the things you can also do is shown on the bottom, um, you can have clothes like in a greenhouse. So it's still kind of open to the environment, but you can also close it. This one on the bottom, like they have retractable nets and greenhouse settings, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So here's a bioreactor. Essentially what happens, you pump the carbon dioxide in, uh, you let the algae grow. You do need some other nutrients, like for the, um, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus. Uh, let the algae grow, harvest it, recycle the water. Good. <laughs> um, from there, uh, you have a few options of how you get the, the oil out. Um, first, you have to separate the algae from the stuff you don't want, the water, um, and then you have to use either chemical or mechanical means to get the oil out. And depending on what species you use, you could end up with ethanol, you could use it with um, biodiesel. You have several options. Um, I just thought this was a really good picture. Um, basically, you take the algae, you grind it up, you separate um, the sugar from the oil, you put it in your car. It's not that simple, but it like, <laughs> but it is. Um, so no, it's, it's pretty easy. It's pretty much what you do to extract olive oil from the olives, except you can use it in car. Okay. Um, one of the big, big controversies with using corn for ethanol is it directly competes with a food source. So <clears throat> about eight bushels, and I think a bushel is eight gallons. Correct me if anyone knows that better. Um, it could be 21 gallons of ethanol fuel, or it could be enough to feed a person for an entire year. 
So here in the United States, it's really not, most of us don't think, well, I'm going to go out and eat a corn, like, cut and corn and gob. Like, I'm not going to go do that. I'm going to go eat chicken steak or, you know, something, chicken breast steak. Um, so, but in other places in developing countries, like in India, that's a direct personal thing for them to have to question. Do I burn my food to make money or do I use my food to eat? Um, so that's a, something they're having to look with. Um, in the U.S., though, we have a trillion bushels of corn that are just sitting in storage, just like from last year's production, because there have been so much produced. There's still some that's just gone to waste because we had too much. So food sources, things that could be eating, like people could be eating this food. We could use it for feedstock. It's going to waste. <laughs> it wasn't him. <laughs> um, all right, so this is just kind of a, a little infographic um, of how much corn production has gone up in the past. Uh, several years, uh, so. And then of course, back to the dead zone. That's another really, really, really big problem with all the like the giant jump in corn production is all that nitrogen, all that phosphorus, it runs off into the Gulf and it creates a dead zone, about 5,000 square miles. That's about the size of Connecticut. Every summer in our Gulf. So what happens is there's no oxygen what happens actually is what we want to do with the algae biofuel. The algae has a giant bloom. It covers the top of the layer of the water. And as it dies, the bacteria uses up all the oxygen. So all the shellfish, all the fish, they die. <laughs> Don't eat seafood this time of year. <laughs> um, so why is this happening? Like, it seems like algae is a really good idea. And it seems like there's some kind of negative things to using corn for ethanol. Um, Basically, um, what happened in 1978 was they uh, started a subsidy, um, 40 cents for ethanol production. So a lot of people started looking into ethanol production. Around the same time, they created the uh, aquatic species program to look into using algae for biofuel. So they started looking into it. Basically, what they found was that um, prices would need to be twice as high as the cost of gasoline in 1998 for uh, algae-based biofuel to be cost-effective. As of 2012, it was three to five times higher. So at some point between 1978 and 2012, algae-based biofuel would have been cost-effective if we kept up with it. Uh, in 1996, uh, they actually um, went ahead and disbanded it because they were like, it's never gonna get that like high. It's not gonna be cost-effective. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So after that, this is the part I knew I was going to need my slides for. <clears throat> so in 2004 was really kind of what boosted ethanol production. Um, they created a volumetric ethanol excise tax credit. So for anyone who blended ethanol into the gasoline, you got a 51% per gallon credit. So people were like, yeah, I want to do that. Um, and then in 2005, they created the first volumetric mandate. So they were like, you need to have X amount of gallons blended into the gasoline every year, and we'll give you money. Um, then 2007, they extended the volumetric mandate, but they did uh, renew research into algae. So that was one of the good things. It's like, yeah. Uh, in 2008, um, they ex uh, establish a tax credit for cellulosic biofuel, so other plants like the soybeans, the palm oils, um, could start getting in on those tax credits. Still no algae. Um, and it wasn't until 2012 that they were like, oh, maybe we should extend this tax credit to algae. Like, we should start looking into that. And it did actually get passed at the time I made the presentation. It was, hadn't been voted on yet. But it has been, so yay. Um, anyway, so what has come from all these policies? The good news is, is our imports, our uh, oil or foreign oil imports have actually peaked and declined. Um, okay. um, so 
we are using yet less foreign oil um, and biofuels are at least partially responsible for that. Um, downside, from 2006, just two years after the first uh, tax credit and a year after the volumetric mandate, corn prices increased from around $2 a bushel to around $7, or from 3 uh, to $7 a bushel. The first year, like from 2005, 2006, it increased a dollar from 2 to $3. So this is just kind of a chart. Basically what I want you to take away, I don't, can y'all see this on this side? Okay. Um, 2005, 2006, we're sitting right around $2. 2012, 2013, $6.89 per bushel. And the good news is, because there's been so much production, because people are like, you can make $7 off a bushel when it does not cost that much to make corn, cost has gone down. So this year they're expecting it to be somewhere between $4 and $5 a bushel, which is still twice as much as it was between 1990 and 2000. But maybe it'll like start to turn around, I don't know. All right. Um, so some more policy impacts of that. Um, in 2007 and 2008, they did start shifting the focus away from corn-based ethanol. Um, and there have been renewed interest in algae-based ethanol. Um, and then 2008, um, non-conventional ethanol biofuels and diesels started to appear on the market. So conventional is um, your, your corn-based ethanol, and non-convention is other cellulosic um, and some algae-based ethanol. So basically, um, by 20, around this time, actually, um, they're expecting conventional ethanols to start to like taper off and level off, and non-conventional ethanol uh, biofuels are expected to really take off. Um, so one last quick thing. Um, in 2007, um, they did actually award um, Solazyme with a grant to look into uh, using algae on a big scale. They produced two biodiesels that are com completely compatible with refineries and your car right now. So put it in your car, go. Um, they've also developed a jet fuel, which is actually like it's 100% algae based and in the US military is actually using it right now. So, yay. Um, so it sounds really awesome, right? It does have some limitations, of course. Um, so open algae, uh, algae ponds are susceptible to environmental factors. Um, some bioreactors, bio especially the closed loop ones, can actually end up consuming more electricity than they actually produce. Downside. Um, it also directly competes with solar, like where algae would be optimal because you get the most solar irradiation is also where the solar panels would be most effective, right? Um, but there are things that, you know, hey, all right. Um, but in conclusion, there's a lot of research going on with algae right now. It's pretty awesome. Um, uh, there's been a renewed interest in algae biofuels that show that, hey, yeah, it would be cost effective. Um, we just need to kind of get on it. Um, it has several benefits over the traditional ethanol biofuels right now. Um, it would help decrease our foreign oil, um, kind of get rid of some of the environmental concerns over pipelines going through environmentally sensitive areas, uh, and it avoids competition with food sources. So, all right. <laughs>